welcome everyone to Stratford Hall's last of the 2020 season um, Colonial Foodways and Culture Series brought to you tonight by Mars Wrigley. Um, that means we will be talking about chocolate. That's one of the benefits of being a, a partner with Mars. Um, my name again is Dr. Kelly Fonto Dietz. I'm the Director of Education, Visitor Engagement and Programming at Stratford Hall. Um, I am a scholar of the African diaspora. I'm a historian, I'm an archeologist and I specialize in the history of slavery, most particularly the history of enslaved people and foodways um, in particular in Virginia. So this series and this program tonight is near and dear to my heart, and it is awesome and an honor to welcome all of you to tonight's program. So what I want to do is I'm going to introduce um, those of you that do not know Stratford very well. I'm going to introduce you all um, to the site and sort of what the program is going to be like tonight. So as I just said, my background is in slavery, um, the history of slavery and Black studies generally. And so when I was hired at Stratford about two and a half years ago, um, I was brought on by the outgoing president, um, John Bacon, to come and bring the narrative of the enslaved to the forefront, to balance it with that of the Lees. Um, Stratford Hall, I'll be introducing to you in a moment in a very quick little slideshow. Um, but I've elevated those stories of the enslaved to then be integrated with the stories of the Lees of Virginia, who's a very important family. So these stories now are presented Presented together. Um, we are also focusing on the history of food at Stratford right now because as my work shows, and I think you'll, you'll hear this echoing later from our wonderful speakers, food is a way to bring together people to talk about really difficult topics. So the history of slavery is something that people are incredibly uncomfortable talking about, learning about, sort of engaging with. And food provides a, a literal way to sort of break bread with people, to talk about these, these histories, the different contributions, and to sort of tease out the harder conversations over a commonality, a common love of food, a common interest of food, and that's what we're going to be doing tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and give you all, I'm going to share my screen, I'm going to give you all the quickest crash course in the history of Stratford Hall, then I'm going to introduce you to our wonderful speakers, then we're going to watch this wonderful video, and then we're going to have a discussion. So I'm going to go ahead and kick this off right now. So pardon me while I share my screen. Just give me one moment here. All right, presents. All right. So I hope you all can hear me. You should be able to. You cannot see my face. Um, I'm squished and that's fine, but you're gonna see these pictures while I talk. So again, my name is uh, Dr. Kelly Fonto Dietz. I have been brought to Stratford um, to tell these stories, to bring in more stories, um, like the ones that you're gonna hear tonight. And tonight we're gonna be talking about Stratford Hall, in particular Christmas at Stratford Hall. And I wanted to give you a little bit of a background so you know exactly who we are, um, where we are and why this is important. So Stratford Hall was a established in 1738 by Mr. Thomas Lee. You see this handsome man with his beautiful velvet coat on the left and his wife, Hannah Ludwell Lee, who was the mistress of the house. Um, they ordered a Georgian style house, which you see down here, this absolutely stunning Georgian style manor house. And it is on the banks of the Potomac River. And it is in one of the most beautiful places in the country that I've ever been. Um, these particular folks, the Lees of Virginia, had a very, very distinct and classy uh, taste, right? They had a very, very distinct palate. And they ate, um, you know, you think about people like Thomas Jefferson, right? And we think about him and his food and his love of the culinary arts. The Lees were doing it before even Jefferson was. Um, they believed in fine dining. They entertained like no one else I've heard of. And they even had particular Madeiras shipped to them and sent across the equator to make sure they got that perfect toast um, as they got warmed up in the casts. Um, one of the Lee's favorite things was chocolate, and that's something we're going to be talking about tonight. But even Thomas Lee's father, Richard Lee, uh, was a connoisseur of chocolate, and we see evidence of them consuming chocolate in the records that we have at the site. So 1738, um, this beautiful beautiful home here and all the outbuildings and right here on the right is the 1738 kitchen. This was ordered to be built, not built by, ordered to be built by Thomas Lee. 
Now it's important to talk about who built this house. And this is where the stories of the enslaved Africans are essential to telling the story of these early, this early period of Stratford Hall. So the Lees were heavily involved in the slave trade. They were actually building a ship on site to be part of the slave trade. So they were big players um, in that market. They were one of the wealthiest families in the colony. And in 1738, when, when Thomas Lee decided to start building this home, um, there were 70 captive West Africans Africans that were brought on the, a boat called the Liverpool Merchant. Um, it left Liverpool, obviously. It went down to the Senegambia region, which is present-day Senegal. And then it went to the Gold Coast, which is present-day Ghana. And then it stopped at St. Helena Island before it made its way across the Atlantic, bringing 70 captured and enslaved West African people to the Potomac River. And then they were sold to uh, Thomas Lee. And they began building the property. And I want to talk for one second here about who these people were. So again, really humanizing their stories, talking about them as individuals, figuring out ways to tell their story alongside the Lees is something that we, we really feel strongly about at Stratford. Um, of these first 70 enslaved West Africans, there were several women who were enslaved. This right here is a, a stunning uh, drawing of a West African woman, and she is wearing what you see here on um, these waist beads that are very, very common. They were very common during the 18th century, and they are even very common now amongst West African women. Um, and they were given to women as a rite of passage, and they were sort of one of the most treasured things that you could have. Over here on the right, and those of you that have seen some of my lectures before, who have been to Stratford to one of my programs, are familiar with this. This is a, a West African waist bead found at the site of where those first Africans were brought in 1738. So we have evidence of their culture, we have evidence of their um, experience at Stratford Hall, and we are weaving those narratives into the story at Stratford Hall. Now, chocolate was very much a part of the transatlantic slave trade, of the Atlantic trade, um, generally. And so right here we have this image, and it's from 1834, so about 100 years after Stratford Hall was established, but this is in British Guyana. And you see here enslaved African men um, chopping down trees, and in the background you see cocoa trees. And so, you know, really sort of setting the stage for tonight's program, thinking about the Atlantic world, thinking about the Lees and their position in the Atlantic world, thinking about the enslaved Africans as they're being forced to come labor on plantations like the one that you're seeing here, as, as well as Stratford Hall, and, and goods being transported, right? Chocolate being shipped from, from Brazil, from South America, from the Caribbean, up to Virginia, and making its way into Stratford Hall's kitchen. So I'm going to take a second here, and again, this is a crash course on Stratford Hall to contextualize tonight's program, but I want to introduce you to a man named Caesar. Caesar was an enslaved chef, and you see his name here, and I'm calling him a chef, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Um, he was an enslaved chef at Stratford Hall in the mid-1700s. He was born around 1732, and he was the head chef at Stratford during Philip Ludwell Lee's reign. And Philip Ludwell Lee, I'm not going to get too deep into the history here, was also very much um, into the culinary world. So Caesar would have been cooking massive feasts on a regular basis, multiple course dinners. Um, he would have been in charge of a full kitchen staff that was also enslaved, cooking for some of the most important people in the colony. He also um, was making chocolate, and we're going to tonight um, be blessed with uh, Dontavius making chocolate on that stone that you see there, but chocolate was actually being made at Stratford Hall um, during the mid um, and sort of, you know, the mid 18th century up into the late 18th century and probably after as well, but Caesar was an African-American enslaved chocolatier. He was making chocolate there, and we have evidence of this not just because we knew that they were sipping chocolate and eating chocolate, because we had one of uh, one of three chocolate stones in the colony during the 1770s. So Stratford Hall had a chocolate stone, the governor's mansion in Virginia had a chocolate stone, and lastly Robert King Carter, who was one of the wealthiest men in the world at that point, also had a chocolate stone. So we know that Caesar was making chocolate during this time, and 
during this time as well, and especially around Christmas time, the enslaved chefs and cooks that were working in the kitchen had a huge burden to, to put on these sorts of feasts um, that were, you know, well known all, all year long, people would look forward to having their, their meal at Christmas. So people talked about these Christmas feasts, and I have some information here. Really quickly, I absolutely detest slides that have text, so forgive me. You can find this later when you get the recording and write it down. But just so you understand the kind of menu that would have to be prepared at Christmas for a, a household like the Lees, you can look to Mount Vernon. Uh, George Washington was dear friends with the Lees. And on Christmas dinner, they had an onion soup. They had oysters in the half shell, broiled salt herring, boiled rockfish. I mean, look, spiced peaches, pickles, Indian pudding, great cake, ice cream, plum pudding. It went on and on and on. So the burden of this work fell on the shoulders of those working in the kitchen. Um, a nice little takeaway here to do another nod to chocolate is how to make wine chocolate. And again, you can come back and uh, you know, record that and make it if you will. And so now I have the pleasure of introducing our phenomenal speakers tonight. And we have here Nicole Moore on the left, Dontavious Williams in the middle, and Cheney McKnight. And they're gonna be talking tonight about not just the food, not just the food, and I'm gonna go ahead and exit out of here so you can see my face, it gets a little bit weird. Hello, um, they're not gonna be just talking about food tonight, they're gonna be talking about the kinds of work that was put onto these people working in the kitchen, right? So, and also the burden of Christmas. And I know that everyone's excited about tonight's program and it's going to be phenomenal, don't get me wrong. But I believe, and I think all of us here believe that a sober history is the right kind of history. To be able to tell the, the beauty of the food that they were eating and cooking along with the fear that came with Christmas, right? So for those of you that do not know this, I just again, we'll be talking about this tonight, but Christmas was a very difficult time for the enslaved community on these plantations. So the enslaved that were working in the field quarter, they had the day off, right? They also were given sometimes, a, a, you know, a, maybe a couple of pennies or a small gift, but they also knew that one week after Christmas that their loved ones were going to be traded away and sold if there was any debt in the family. So with this joy of Christmas, which really, you know, in the context of slavery is, is very complicated, with this joy of Christmas came this, the sadness and the fear that was going to be coming very shortly afterwards. Now, if you were working in the big house, you had a lot of work to do. You did not have that day off. A matter of fact, it was your most busiest day of the year. So again, thinking about that menu that we just saw from Mount Vernon, thinking about the food that you're going to see cook cooked here by these wonderful interpreters in a moment, thinking about all of the energy and all of the passion and all of the fear and all of these things all mixed together. That's what Christmas was on these sites for the enslaved. So on that note, I wanna welcome you, Nicole Moore. You're a public historian and now a dear friend of mine and you interpret slavery and you have a phenomenal uh, following. Cheney McKnight as well from Not Your Mama's History. I think a lot of you I know joined because she's here. Um, she is a star in herself and does phenomenal interpretation. And Dontavious Williams, who has now, this is what, your third, your third trip back here. So um, he is our sort of stand in for interpreting Caesar, right? And enslaved cooks in that kitchen. And I have to say, I went to Stratford for the first time about five years ago and I walked into that kitchen and it just pulled me in. Um, and I, I was beyond excited and moved seeing the three of you work in that space and bring honor to that space. It was phenomenal. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you are welcome. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and kick off this beautiful film. So for those of you that are new to watching these films on Zoom, um, we cannot have them in HD because they would take forever to buffer. So it's gonna be a low definition version. If you want the high one, I will send it to you, but this is just gonna be a little gritty. I mean, no more gritty than, than our faces right now, but just so you know, um, this is what, you know, this is, this is the ways in which we're gonna be dealing with Zoom and it's a beautiful representation of what y'all did here. I didn't do too much. Y'all did the work, but the kinds of stories that we're telling in this space. So I'm going to go ahead and play this cooking demonstration, and then we're going to kick off the conversation. All right. Hello. 
Hello, my name is Nicole Moore and I'm a public historian. This evening, as we are celebrating the holiday season, we really want to talk about the lives of the enslaved and what they might have been eating. So tonight, I've got a little salt pork, got a couple pieces of turnip, a little onion and some greens. We're going to break that down and make that in a nice pot and then we're going to fry up some catfish something that would have been found in the Potomac River just behind us. And this is something that the enslaved would have been eating to supplement their diets. So, I've got my bit of onion right here. I've already got a couple of pieces already chopped up. We've got just purple turnip, nothing special. But this time of the year, especially after the first frost, your turnips are gonna be sweeter. And I know that there are some people who are like, ugh, turnips can be bitter. But this time of year, right when the ground is getting cold, it's really gonna bring out that sweetness. And this as a root vegetable is going to last. So if you're pulling these out of the garden, the enslaved knew that they could have this for a couple of weeks. This is going to add depth to something very simple that they would have had. Your greens are just gonna be what's out in the fields. And again, after that first frost, those greens are gonna be nice and sweet. So when you're thinking about your curly mustards of today or your turnip greens, same thing. We've got a couple pieces cut up here and you just wanna strip the stems. They would have probably just thrown all of this in here, torn it up by hand and getting it in there. We're gonna head over to the fire. I'm gonna take my piece of fat and this is a one pot. We're just putting this in because at this time, while I'm preparing this dish, there are a lot of other meals being made in this kitchen at the same time. And as we're feeding our community, we have to understand that our priority is the big house. So we're doing this really quickly. I just wanna bring this out. You don't want to be in the fire because it's hot. But I just wanna put my greens in here. I just wanna put those roots, get all of that in there. I might have a little bit of my kitchen pepper, just a mix of a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Y'all don't need to know all our secrets. But we just wanna put enough in just to season that up. And once it goes back over the fire, we're gonna let that sit and break down. And again, this is happening, took literally two to three minutes because I know that my priority is now going to shift to what's happening in the house. Now we want our catfish. And like I said, the Potomac River is right behind us and catfish is one of those fishes that's in there. Something that the enslaved community would have gone caught to supplement maybe that salt pork, that cornmeal. If we've got a little bit at the end of the week, we might find some lard, we might render down some fat. We might wanna fry up this catfish just a little bit with our cornmeal. So. I've got catfish already chopped up because I don't want to make whole pieces. I want to make them just little bites, little nuggets, if you will. I've got my kitchen pepper. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to dredge my catfish in my cornmeal. So I'm gonna go ahead and heavily season my cornmeal. We want to make sure that that gets in there. We want to mix that up really well. And then because you can never have too much of the seasoning on this, I'm gonna go ahead and sprinkle a little magic on my catfish here. And a kitchen pepper is just something that the enslaved would have. It's just a mix of various herbs and spices. Again, I'm not telling you the secrets, but it's gonna have maybe some pepper. This one smells like it has maybe a little bit of clove, a little bit of nutmeg, some salt in there. Just something that's gonna give additional flavors. So I got a nice cute little piece of catfish right here. My lard is already going. You wanna have a hot pan. You wanna preferably do this in a cast iron. That's what they would have been using. And we're working this over the fire. So you also want to be very careful when you're doing this. All right, so we've got our catfish out. Like I said, very quick, very simple. It's something that we could snack on as we were doing all of the other prep and all of the other cooking, but it's fresh, it's from the river, it's authentic. 
That's what we're doing. Hello, my name is Chaney McKnight, and today I'm cooking oyster soup for our Christmas program to show what the Lees would have been eating around Christmas time. So, right now I'm chopping up very tiny pieces of onion, and I have a bit of salt pork, and so I've heated up some butter, and I'm going to put it, saute these items real quick in the butter. Give it a bit of a stir and then put it, put this kettle back over the fire. You want to saute it very nicely to get that really nice flavorful base within the oyster soup. So you may have seen me referring to a sheet of paper while doing this recipe. This is an oyster soup receipt or recipe and Many uh, enslaved cooks were actually literate, so they could be given a recipe from anywhere from around the world and do it right here in the kitchens. So right now, I'm actually going to take the liquor from the oysters, as well as a slurry, which is flour and water. It makes it just a little bit easier to mix in flour without getting clumps into the soup. I'll go ahead and pour it into the pot. Right now, I have some rich milk, or as we know of it today as heavy cream. And we're gonna also add this to the pot. It's gonna really make this dish very rich and delicious. Um, make sure that you keep stirring, keep stirring, because we don't want this to curdle. Now, once we bring our milk mixture to a boil, we then want to add in the stars of the show, the oysters. So right now I'm gonna go take it over and add it to the boiling mixture. Remember to continue to stir this. Um, this is a cream, meaning that it can burn quite swiftly. Um, it also can curdle, so keep a close eye on this oyster soup. This is gonna cook for about 15 more minutes, 10 to 15 more minutes. Keep an eye on it throughout that time. It'll be very delicious. Well, good evening. I'm Dontavius Williams, and I am a living history interpreter. Glad to be here at Stratford Hall today to make some chocolate. We've enjoyed chocolate since the colonial times, and right here at Stratford Hall, there was a chocolatier. But guess what? He was enslaved. He did a phenomenal job of bringing something from nothing. He turned something that was bitter into something that was very delectable. Remember the last time we talked? 
something from nothing. We're going to turn bitter into sweet today. Caesar was the cook here. He was born in 1732 and around 1750, he was the, the chief cook here in this kitchen and chocolate making was his job. Now around the holiday season, this was really the highlight of the time was to have some chocolate, to have the really good things. We all love chocolate, we all love sweets, but today we're gonna to talk about sipping chocolate. There was a process. It didn't just come just because it was, you know, grown on a tree. As a matter of fact, you couldn't use the cocoa bean just as it was. There's a process. You have to roast the beans. You have to roast the, 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 the holes off and peel them. You winnow them and then you grind them in a mortar and pestle. Once you get the cocoa beans like you need them, you put them in the mortar and pestle and you grind them. And you get what are called nibs, chocolate nibs. You want to get it as fine as you can in the mortar and pestle, and then you want to transfer it to the chocolate stone where you can therein grind it. Now, you don't just grind chocolate or, or, or melt it down on a cold stone. You have to have a warm stone. And so as you saw Nicole and Cheney cooking and they were moving around a big rock, they were moving around this chocolate stone um, and we wanted to keep it warm. And so as we do this, we're just going to grind it. It only gets delicious when you add the special ingredient, spices and sugar. Sugar is what makes the world go round. This is a very time consuming process but helps you get those aggressions out. <laughs> um, I'm going to grab some sipping chocolate that I actually put on a little earlier in just a second. Let me grab it. So the only thing in this chocolate pot here is the chocolate that has been melted down or ground down. We have some sugar in it and then some spices, some cinnamon. And so you just take it and water. You take it and you want to stir it. It gets thick. It gets really delicious. It's really good and warm. Now the very last thing that you want to do is you want to dress it with a little bit more spice and that is nutmeg. Again, this would have been enjoyed as the highlight of the evening in the colonial times, sipping chocolate. So as you can see, we're back. We've got our catfish fresh out that grease. We've got our turnip greens. You see those bits of turnip in there with that salt pork. And this is what the enslaved are going to be eating after we have made a big meal for the lees. And of course we have the highlight of the evening, which is that sipping chocolate to round things off for the big house there. Um, and Caesar, again, I want to mention him um, being that chocolatier that we honor on this evening. And we have here some oyster stew in which the leaves would be eating for their main meal. And it is very rich. It has those fresh oysters along with that beautiful cream, um, something very nice for the evening. Listen, we wanna thank you for joining us as we take a 
tour right back in time and learn how Christmas and the holiday season was celebrated by the enslaved as well as the Lee family. Enjoy your holiday. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> all I can say is that I got to eat all of that food. <laughs> and Nicole had to like beat me off the catfish. The catfish was here. Every time it came out, I was like, right here. <laughs> the seasonings, that catfish was was on point. <laughs> Everything was was wonderful. But I think, you know, that night, and, and it was wonderful too. So Justin for now, I want to give him a shout out. Um, as well as Chris, because they, you know, they really helped bring our, our ideas to life, right? So just the way that they set the kitchen up. And for those of you that have seen the other programs that we've had, the table was in a very different place. So their idea, which I think worked out beautifully, was to have the table um, perpendicular to, um, to the the fireplace to allow really to see what a kitchen would have looked like back then. And I've been to so many kitchen interpretations and there's always one person, maybe two, and it's very stiff. Looking in the window when I walked up from when I, you know, ran an errand and came back and seeing you all in that space was one of the most powerful things I've ever seen. Because you are doing, you are telling these stories, you are testifying in 2020 on behalf of those that could not testify for themselves. And seeing you all in that space, I'm getting goosebumps just talking about this right now. It was a spiritual moment. So thank you all for bringing that honor and that that presence to that space. How did it feel cooking in that kitchen? Cheney's yeah. like, oh God. Yeah. I've done kind of that group cooking outside. I've never done mm -hmm. it inside. Of, well, I've done it a few times with Dontavious in a building, mm -hmm. but it mm -hmm. is something to have that movement and to know that the space wasn't monolithic and that there mm -hmm. wouldn't just be one person, but there's so much happening and you have to be aware. And when people think about, you know, historically folks have been taught that the enslaved didn't really know much. They didn't know how to do much. And that is why they were enslaved and brought over. But when you think about how we're moving, how we're shifting things, how we're heating the cold, just the operations of the kitchen, keeping track of what we're making, keeping track of what the other person is making, it it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a sad poetry in motion. And it's when we're in that space, knowing that we are representing those who didn't have a voice and whose lives weren't seen by all, to really give them that honor to me is, is amazing. And it's why I love doing what I do. And it, it seems exactly like a dance. Um, I like that language you use, Nicole, mm -hmm. uh, a sad poetry. Um, I think it's also, um, we are lucky to have really good chemistry with mm -hmm. the three of us um, and that we can kind of anticipate each other's needs. And then we're also just friends. So yeah. um, there's <laughs> like a natural communication that people have between friends. Um, but I, I always think about um, when you're uh, enslaved in an environment and the relationships people have mm -hmm. and have to forge uh, just because uh, that was just one night. Um, but imagine um, going through probably half the time we're in there um, as an enslaved woman, we're probably pregnant. Mm -hmm. About 50% of the time we are working in the kitchen. Uh, so I, I think that that also adds a very interesting element. I've also cooked in many, many um, historic kitchens. And um, from just um, slave cabins to a uh, single family household um, to middling class and urban environments to really nice um, kitchens. And it's also always something very interesting about the kitchens of uh, Virginia Gentry. Uh, they put a lot 
like clock jacks, the newest technology. Uh, they are trying to really put forth their best foot within their food. Um, their enslaved are an extension of themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so this speaks to the woman of the household. Um, and although, as we were saying before, these people would have had pride within in their work. And um, at the end of the day, when we presented this, I know that we had a great deal of pride uh, in what we presented and the amount of multitasking that it takes to work in a kitchen like that. Yeah. And think about too, uh, you both touched on this before we let Dontavius sort of break it down. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, the, like you saw that menu that Mount Vernon had, that George Washington had, right? You all literally, like, you did a sip in chocolate. That's, like, not even on the menu. That's just, you're drinking that. And then an oyster stew. That is, like, a, you know, one-thirtieth of what y'all would have been cooking back in the day, right? So yeah. thinking about that as well, just so many things, having it all hot at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it takes some serious multitasking skills, skills, right, to do that yeah. work. Yeah. It would have been Absolutely. a dance. Yeah. yeah, I love so, the dance. Mm -hmm. You you stole you stole my my response. See, this is what happens when we <laughs> all think with the same mind. Yep. Um, and, and Kelly, you made you made the point that I was going to make. Um, but to answer your question first, it felt it was a, a great honor to be in that space yet again. Mm -hmm. I always go in and honor the space in which um, Caesar called home <laughs> you know what i'm saying uh -huh. um, as well as those everyone else who who worked in that space um this is again like you said my third time cooking in the kitchen there at Stratford hall but the first time with someone else and who better to work with than my mentor nicole moore and my very good friend um cheney mcknight um again we all think with the same mind so yeah. as cheney said we anticipate each other's needs uh -huh. um you guys saw me busy, you know, and everybody <laughs> shot. But you know, because I know what they need, you know, I'm going to do everything that I can. And, and that's yeah. how a kitchen works. If you go into a modern kitchen today, it's that same dance. It's that same, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. same thing that's happening. Um, with, with our kitchen, it just didn't have the cussing and the yelling and things that were going on. But, <laughs> but we were only, we only prepared one course yeah it was one course this fam these would have been multiple courses over multiple hours that started before the sun rose yeah. and ended well after the sun went down um so the the work i'm sure the frustrations would have been there um but they had to work through it they had no other choice yeah, exactly. um, but to but to work through it and to deliver a quality beautiful meal that was hot and ready to be served on time. So mm -hmm. whereas for me, it was an honor to be able to breathe life back into that space again, and even more life that we now have other interpreters in there with us um, to even show the, the differences. A lot of times people think that women were the only cooks that were in these kitchens mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that they were the head cooks. But this, this, pla this plantation here proves that to be different um, yep. and, and not to slight any women at all, but we have to get rid of the whole gender role um, concept when it comes to cooking um, and, and in these historic spaces. It was whoever had that skill and whoever could make it happen made it happen. Um, it, it, it just was what it was. And Don, to your point, it's not only, um, you know, dissuading the gender roles, but it's there were multiple cooks doing multiple things. You had bakers. Mm -hmm. You had a mm -hmm. chocolatier, you had a head chef, you had somebody that was in charge of frying. Like there, there's just, mm -hmm. there were layers and there were jobs. And when we, again, it's going back to thinking of these kitchens as those busy living, breathing spaces instead of just one person trying to do it all. There's so mm -hmm. much happening. And the size of that kitchen, I would venture that it would have been more than three people in there working mm -hmm. at the same time. You've got, you've got to have somebody that's keeping the fire going, it's keeping it steady. Yeah, and there's a whole separate kitchen in the house, mm -hmm. you know, downstairs. That warming kitchen that's downstairs. So this staff for this for this family was huge, mm -hmm. had to have been to be able to create. And then not to mention the servers, Sonny, 
those people who a- actually mm-hmm. inc- that made the food servable, you know, and that and that served the family and their guests. But like, if we look into, I have worked in commercial kitchens and restaurants today, mm-hmm. um, and and I've seen that dance. I've seen people move, and it's the same concept. You know, you have a job to do, and you just got to get it done. Let's get through this rush. Once we get through the rush, then we can breathe. You know, but while we're doing this, we're gonna nibble on we're gonna nibble on some catfish. <laughs> <laughs> and I think all of us have have worked in some type of uh, commercial kitchen at some point. Myself, I've worked in catering, I mean, yeah. and there's always this period where you are like exhausted. Mm-hmm. <laughs> at the end of the day, you're just exhausted, but you still you either have like take down or one last course to go and mm-hmm. uh, all right, you got to clean up and you're like, oh my goodness. And there's always the people around you mm-hmm. who can rally you to, to the end. Yeah. That's the thing. That's the thing. Because yeah. by the end of the night, uh, we were literally holding each other up. Done. Yeah, <laughs> literally. That that last thank you scene. <laughs> we were holding on. We were holding on. And and that was for us, you know, in the grand scheme of doing a living history demonstration, that was short. That was light work. We were in there yeah. maybe four hours. And we've done events where we've been in there all day. Mm. But it was just the space and the motion and the movement in that floor. It was it was killer. And to experience that just for four hours and then to really reflect that this was somebody's mandated life Mm -hmm. they didn't and And the shoes too i know you know when you wear those authentic shoes i mean dontavious's feet shani yours too i think you're all y'all feet were killing you because you know you're wearing these authentic shoes and it's literally like a hard piece of leather with a kind of hard piece of leather on top on that brick Mm -hmm. floor that there alone. were no insoles. Yeah. Right. Right. And the fact for, for me, the fact I, I can sum it up to the fact of being out of shape. Um, and I'm not saying like physically fit or whatever, but like as a historical interpreter, because of COVID, I haven't really mm-hmm. had the opportunity to cook mm-hmm. as much and to interpret this way as much. So yep. um you 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 get out of shape, you get out of practice and when you're used to putting those shoes on every single day, when you're used to wearing mm-hmm. the clothing, it becomes who you are. Um, mm-hmm. And going from August to December without doing any programming in between, it it wears on you. It really wears on you. So, yeah. We've got a bunch of questions coming yes. in. So let's go ahead and kick these off. Um, so That's Bobby cool. asks, and I'm happy that you asked this because this is something I was super excited about the answer to this question. Um, So yeah, let's get to it. Okay, Bobby asks, um, I'm hoping that you'll get to this question sometime this evening. I'm originally from Maine and always grew up having oyster stew on Christmas Eve with my family. I had no idea it was a colonial tradition until I saw the description for the program earlier this week. I have continued the oyster tradition on my own Mm -hmm. for Christmas Eve, not knowing it was a tradition and was hoping that you could enlighten me about its origins. So um, (laughs) I think... Every Southerner I know, first of all, I know exactly. Just get ready, everybody. Put your seatbelts on because it blew all of our minds. So, yeah. all right, so oyster stew is what you eat at Christmas time, right? You know, you eat oysters with the month of ER. It's just kind of what you do. We know that it was served. I mean, the Lees ate it all the time. A lot of these folks on the river, if you were near any kind of water, you were eating oysters every single day but particularly on Christmas. Now, these big plantation homes, right, um, their enslaved cooks were either enslaved West Africans or enslaved African Americans. I found out, this is where my brain pops, um, that oyster stew originated in Gambia, West Africa. (laughs) So, yeah, so you've got seafood chowders and things like that, but taking oysters, specifically oysters, and turning them into a stew is something that these West Africans would have been very familiar with. Now, their dishes would have looked very different than a nice, mm-hmm. creamy, seasoned with salt uh, sort of dish that you made Cheney, right? But the idea of this oyster stew was something that was really, 
I think came into fruition with the, the, you know, the skills and the ideas and the recipes of these enslaved Africans being then sort of colliding into this colonial space in these kitchens. So thank you for asking that because we all kind of flipped out a little bit when we were like looking into this and I went online and I was like, wait a minute, how did I miss this with like all my years of research? And it kind of started off as a bit of a joke. We were like, well, what do we want to eat? And I was like, oysters. Let's get oysters. You sure was like, Just give me seafood. I'm there. I was like, all oh, the seafood. And then, you know, doing the research, we were like, we knew there was a reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the oysters, too, as Cheney was saying, as you're cooking it, that can break in two seconds. And, you know, a, a beautiful oyster stew that's made. And think about I, when I give lectures on oyster stew, which I've done before, you literally think about the work that goes into that. Now, oyster stew would have been one of the main big sort of, you know, showcase items on a on a table for Christmas. But think about having to get how many oysters were in that? I mean, my goodness, what, like 40, so 50 or that, something? Right. So it's 16. There are 16 oysters to a pint. A pint. Yeah, okay. Three pints. Okay, so, and, you know, we ate those oysters pretty quickly. So, say the leaves are having a dinner for 20 people, right? Yeah. You're going to need a lot more oysters than that. And so, uh -huh. thinking about the enslaved folks, the fishermen that had to go down there and get the oysters, clean them, yeah. shuck them, right? Um, then you have to make that brew. You can't let it burn. You can't let it break. And you can't mm -hmm. overcook it because, one, it's Christmas dinner, but two, you're enslaved. And you don't yeah. want to deal with the you know, those issues that come with the responsibility of messing up the person who enslaves you, their dinner, right? So yeah. there's all those things built into that. So thank you for asking that. Teresa says, um, and I love this, as an FYI, I'm a descendant of the enslaved ancestors owned by the Carter Lee family via Char Charles Carter Lee. Teresa, I would love to talk to you offline. Um, older brother, General Robert E. Lee. Okay, yeah, we have to talk. We are still here to tell our ancestral stories. Thank you for this presentation. Thank you for zooming in and supporting this. Thank and you, we Teresa. have to have a conversation. Please. So thank like you Teresa, for that. Teresa uh, Vega? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Teresa. Yeah. <laughs> so Melinda asked, and you touched on this a minute ago, was it more common to have a male or female chef as the leader of the kitchen crew? It just depended on where you were. Um, in yeah. the beginning, the earlier years, and I'm talking late 1600s, to early 1700s, it was mostly men. Um, but as the 1800s, you know, the colonial era really sort of came into fruition, you have more women moving into that role. But you also have more women being you know, sort of captured and brought over as well. So thank you for asking that question. Yes, go ahead. Um, I think we also do a lot of comparisons between um, households in North America mm -hmm. to England. So things like mm -hmm. in England, the person who is serving, they're most likely footmen, male yep. footmen. But in America, you will see enslaved women serving at tables as well, mm -hmm. uh, which is a complete change from European style uh, service. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of differences. Also, um, you know, we have some differences in cooks and chefs. So they usually uh, make the difference between calling men who are cooks chefs. Mm -hmm. and women cooks, which, same thing, but, you know. <laughs> that still happens <laughs> now, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. Titles. <laughs> Thank you, Cheney. Y'all want to add anything else? We got more questions here. Mm -mm. Let's go to the questions next. are live. <laughs> All right, Gina Mars, wonder if there's a relation to the Mars chocolate family. Um, how do you get the chocolate off the warm chocolate stone? Besides just like sticking your face <laughs> and leaving it. <laughs> well, <laughs> the funny thing though is you don't want to just stick your face in, in that chocolate because <laughs> it smells delicious. It smells so good, but it's so bitter. It was so bitter. You know, it, yeah. it, it has, it's, you don't want to no eat that. No sugars in it yet. No sugar. No so, but yeah, I do. I like though. that. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't bad. I like dark, bitter chocolate. And I have to say, it was not as bad as they're making it. Nicole and I were like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people, but some people like that dark bitter yeah. chocolate. You know, some people have the love that. But ideally, what you do is you you continue to put the nibs on, and mm -hmm. and the more nibs you put on, and the more that you grind it, it begins to come off the stone itself. 
the stone is kind of set at a at an angle. I, what would you guys say? Maybe I wouldn't say a forty five degree angle, but it, there's an angle no. of slope enough. About forty five. It was about forty five because by the t by the time you were done with just that little bit, you had a nice little it started pool to drip. Plate. Yeah, yeah. It, so it, it begins to to drip down, and and then you can capture it in you know in a container. Um, we just for the for the video, we just didn't have you know that much chocolate on the stone. Thank you for and asking. Good. There was a heat source underneath the underneath mm. the stone. Yeah, um, that helps. I have had the pain of letting that chocolate cool before you clean up. <laughs> it would behoove you to clean the stone before. Well, it's hot. <laughs> yeah, before it cools down, that, that was a terrible experience. We didn't do that. I believe. I believe. I believe the people out at Stratford didn't allow did that not. to happen. They did not. Yeah, so we'll I, be I, done. I, I think they're still chipping away. <laughs> Yeah, Amy's in there. They're a little tired. Yeah, Amy. <laughs> yeah, Amy. <laughs> She's doing some archaeology. She's probably just eating it. She's making like chocolate chip cookies out of it for her family I or something. It. I love it. <laughs> That's so awesome. Um, all right. Uh, Camilla Henderson says, oh, this is wonderful. Uh, the film is just beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for this gift and blessing. I feel so affirmed as a black woman in Det Detroit that the things I cook, even now for my family, have roots yeah. all the way back into the 18th century. Yeah. And it is good to see three living history interpreters. I agree. Um, let me see here. They truly brought this experience to life within the kitchen. Thank you and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I always tell people when we're cooking and they see what we're making, they're like, this is familiar. I grew up with this. And I love telling people of all backgrounds, your diet has more in common with the enslaved community than it does the people who would have been in the house. And when they realize that and they realize the simplicity, food is that great thing that brings us all together. They mm -hmm. want to learn more. They want to understand more. And it's it's nestled in that food culture. So this mm -hmm. is so true. Even to the, the frou-frou oyster mm -hmm. stew. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> See, we gotta. I would love to. Next time we're all together, we should make a West African version of it. That's more of a red base with palm oil and yeah. yeah. Come down. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah. let's do it. Good, good do stuff. It. <laughs> and, right. and I didn't eat oysters before. Yeah, I didn't eat oysters it? before, and I I had it, and it it changed my mind. I'm thinking about making it for Christmas for my family. That's awesome. So, yeah. Look at you. Yeah. I love. Oh man, yeah. Oysters, anything seafood makes me happy. All right, um, Aaron asks, um, how much input would Caesar have had in the recipes? I mean, would he have had, would he have been able to create original recipes or would he have had to follow the Lee's instructions exactly? I'm gonna go ahead, I can answer this, but go ahead y'all and hit that one if you want, or I can just go ahead and take it, whatever you want. We're gonna deflect, deflect to you. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> Looking at me like, I think you're gonna speak on that right now. So um, Caesar and any enslaved cook or chef would have had some, you know, influence in what they were making. So it really depended on the plantation specifically. But you have some plantations, just like you have some households now, where you have got you know a controlling, you know, person who wants to do everything and make sure all the food is right and the micromanagers and all that. And you also have some people that are just kind of like you do you. But if you think about it these plantations, the mistress of the house, right? So Hannah Ludwell Lee or any of the other Lee ladies that were sort of in charge of that space, they're not going to be down there all the time, you know, reading recipes and sort of micromanaging Caesar. And so what you see a lot of times, and you see this in evidence in the cookbooks and the recipes that changed over time, but you see the, the influence of West African food sort of making its way into the, the written recipes. And so this to me proves that not only did enslaved cooks, um, you know, they were able to follow the recipes and make that European food, but they also brought their own food into that space and that their own food into the dining room in the Lees, in the dining room at Monticello, into the dining room at Montpelier and these other sites. And you see this in the cookbooks where in the 18th century, you've got some, you know, the handwritten cookbooks and a couple of ones that were published. It's very European focused. By the 19th century, these cookbooks are talking about okra stew, gumbo, jambalaya. I mean, these are all African dishes that have then been brought to that Virginia table through the the labor and the minds and the skills of enslaved chefs so it was a mix long way long long-winded answer there but it was a a little bit of everything 
Melinda that, that asks, sounds, go ahead. Hmm? That sounds like a page right out of Bound to the Fire. <laughs> you better cut it out. It, <laughs> it does. For no, those it, but <laughs> seriously, that was what I was. That was what I was going to quote. But yeah, oh, I, have my, I, I have my copy back here behind me. But yeah, that was I was going to quote that. But I figured I'd let the, let you do it. Well, yeah. thanks. So for those of you that are just meeting all of us, and um, that's my book that I wrote. It's called Bound to the Fire, How Virginia's Enslaved Cooks Helped Invent American Cuisine. And um, yeah, so that's right out of there. That's why I was like, I guess I'll answer this because I answer this question all the time. All right. Melinda asks, how many workers would be in the kitchen at a time? Y'all can hit that one. It varied from plantation mm -hmm. to plantation the, for the size um, yeah. of of, of the plantation and the number of people that they had. You know, if you have a, a little small plantation, you don't want to use 90% of your enslaved workers to be working in the kitchen. That doesn't make sense. It's not profitable. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to be able to use the percentage that makes the most sense mm -hmm. um, to, to be able to create. Uh, so for instance, for the Lee family, because they have such a massive home and they love entertaining and cuisine, of course they would have a, a pretty decent size. They're pretty sizable, yeah. Yeah. So, but it, the the quick answer is it varied from plantation to plantation. Now, my uh, my friends yeah. here may have other um, scientific mm -hmm. evidence. <laughs> I was gonna say you pretty much nailed it. Okay. Yeah, you you really hit the ball, the nail on the head. Uh, some cooks, um, some households, smaller middling households, may have had one enslaved cook, um, but then they, for special events like Christmas, they would actually bring in people from the, uh, from the outer buildings, from the field to actually work as servers um, because these things are extra luxuries. And the idea that there would be like 10 people just working in the house uh, would have been such as John Tavia said, such a waste of resources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and some people actually did both. They worked for a portion of the year in jobs that are needed. And then the other portion, they may have worked in some form or fashion in the house. This, that's perfect because Caesar's son, Caesar Jr., actually mm -hmm. worked in like the stable yard uh, mm -hmm. or worked with the, 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 the coaches and things. But he also worked in the kitchen as well. He played. He had double duty. Good answers. Michelle Lewis um, says, "Who would teach the enslaved to read, and who taught Caesar how to make chocolate?" Um, so a lot. It's funny because people have this idea that in, you know all enslaved folks didn't know how to read, and not only were they teaching themselves secretly how to read, but um, a lot of times, especially if you were enslaved in the kitchen, it was beneficial to the white family to have you be literate because again they don't want to be down there reading the recipe to you every day. So a lot of times the mistress would teach, or other African Americans would teach. I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't as crazy and unheard of as people think of today. Um, as far as Caesar making chocolate, I'm doing research right now and I'm still looking into that. There were only three chocolate stones in the whole colony during his period. And so I'm thinking, um, you know, I'm not sure when that chocolate stone got to Stratford, if it was there the whole time he was there, if it came when he was older or before him, when a man named Richard Minot was the chef there and he was an indentured Englishman. Um, but I'm thinking, I'm assuming that maybe one of the Lees or maybe even, you know, maybe even they brought Caesar up to some place like New York or somewhere where there's a coffee house and a chocolate house because a place like New York, as you know, Cheney, had a lot of chocolate being made in public. And so you could easily walk in and see, oh, what's that stone? I mean, what was it about that stone that made, you know, the Lees buy one for their own, you know, kitchen? So I think with that investment probably also came a trip with maybe Caesar um, to a place to see it be made to learn those skills. You Any better guesses than that, y'all? Uh -oh. no. Thank you for asking. Yeah, and on and literacy. Uh, yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah. I think we're going to say the same thing. Sure, just make sure that we don't look at uh, enslaved persons learning how to read as a humanitarian good. Mm -hmm. This is uh, increasing their value um, uh, on the auction block. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, some enslaved mothers may actually have been hesitant for their children to learn how to read and write in, in, the eye, in front of the eyes of the enslaver. 
-hmm. maybe they would want them to learn in secrecy just because once they know that child's value actually goes up yep and we have to look at slavery, 18th century slavery and 19th century slavery completely differently mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because think about it. We've, we've heard about Phyllis Wheatley. She, yep. was, a, she was a poet yep. um, and it was unheard of. We think it's unheard of for um, enslaved people to, to be able to read and write. Um, but 18th century slavery was completely different um, than, than what we are seeing with this, this chattel slavery of the 19th century. But the antebellum period, yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and then you have those things like Nat Turner's insurrection. You uh -huh. have, you know, mm -hmm. all of these things wherein they want to be able to keep information from spreading. So what better way to keep information from spreading by changing laws? Yep. It's illegal uh -huh. for you to know how to read. You know, the, the whole dumbing down of the enslaved, uh -huh. that, happens, that happens a little later on. But again, like Cheney said, it, ideally it was to increase the value um, of those enslaved, of your property. You know, you want to do everything that you can to increase the property value. Just like we add a, a deck onto our homes to make yep. our homes more valuable. Um, the, the skill of knowing how to read or knowing how to be a chocolatier actually made Caesar more valuable. Mm -hmm. You know, even in his older age, Chocolate making, I'll just put you off and let you let you make chocolate or I can rent you off with my uh -huh. chocolate stone and, and let you, I'm not saying that that happened, but that's a possibility. Or they could rent them off to teach someone else to have an exactly. apprentice. Exactly. This is, I love yeah. this. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to say once again, uh, I had such a great time in the kitchen even mm -hmm. though uh, it, it's a very serious affair uh -huh. walk in the shoes of the ancestors. It is always a pleasure to walk in those shoes with my community. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think to that point, I think one of the things that people, because it is so serious, like we never want to take away from that. But y'all, when I tell you we had fun and it was knowing that the enslaved would have been in there talking about folks, Ooh. talking about Mrs. Got one more time to come up in here before I spit in her food. Like those things, that yeah. that was happening, that frustration and that snark and that, she got one Did more time, y'all. Did you see that hat she was wearing? Did you see that hat? Right. It, it looked Just, crazy. That hat looked crazy. I know she don't think she looked good. <laughs> and, 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 and that was real. And yeah. usually when we do interpreting together, Dontavious and I, at least, people are like, y'all have a lot of fun together. And we have to remember that these are, they're still people, right? Exactly. And this situation is crap. But we might get these jokes off because, oh, they, they all know that we, that kitchen pepper got a little bit more pepper in it. It's going to hurt coming mm -hmm. out. Watch this. Like, two we, time burn. <laughs> two time. Like, and it's, and it's knowing that there were coping mechanisms to get through. Mm -hmm. And I think when people, when they realize, no, we're not being disrespectful, but we are trying to show you what real life was. That's what we need people to understand. There is so much focus on just the literal misery of slavery that we forget these are people. And if they're constantly, if they can't escape it. It's, it's a mental cloud, but if you're constantly in that cloud, how are you gonna be able to push forward every day? How are you gonna be able to say, look, I'm." this might be my day. I might get free today. Or mm -hmm. my, the next generation is going to be free. And just having that will to survive, we, we laugh to hide our tears. And, yeah. and getting people to really understand that, that's important too when we talk about the enslaved and when people want to give agency and humanize, we need to be able to show a breadth of emotion. Mm -hmm. so, so 250 years from today, 2020, people are going to be reading our Facebook posts. They're going to be reading tweets mm -hmm. um, and they're going, to, they're going to take away the humanity. How in the world were they able to make it in America in 2020 mm -hmm. with a pandemic, with, with a, the sickness of racism, the sickness of systematic injustice, all of these different things. These people, they couldn't make it. Every day was doom and gloom and misery. But can I tell you one thing about Dontavious? Mm -hmm. 2020 has been my year. Mm -hmm. I have enjoyed every single moment of 2020 in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of all of these issues that we have going on in this world. Um, I've been doing pretty good, you know. 
we literally count our blessings. And I, and I do believe that is what the enslaved did. Every day they woke up together with their families was a blessing. They may not end that day the same, but every day that they could wake up next to their children, have a spouse, have a spouse that's recognized as their spouse. Those right. are the things that we also walk with and we take with us. And that's why we do what we do. You know, and it's not watering it down because you see us smile, because you see mm -hmm. us laugh. It's not watering it down and it's not being disrespectful. I've had people to question me and question the authenticity of yeah. what I do, even in my storytelling, because sometimes Adam seems a little bit hokey and a little bit happy, but it's a method and it's a reason why the story is told the way that it's told. Because if we want to get a message across to people who are resistant to mm -hmm. The, the lesson and the history of it all, we have to be able to build trust. And, and, and the way that we all interpret um, is, is that way. Every, every one of us on this call tonight have a way of drawing the public in, mm -hmm. gaining that trust, and then boom, hit you mm -hmm. over the head with the truth. And I think that, you know, just the way that you said that, it's important though, right? And I think that anybody living now would understand that they would want to be acknowledged and remembered by their whole self, right? Yes. They don't want to be sugarcoated. They don't want, you know, their, their modes of survival and perseverance to then be outweighed by what happened to them. So, you know, it's, again, it's that sober history that's, I think, really important. We've got a bunch of questions here. Yeah, I want to try to get to more of these. Yeah. So, um, it's a little well, this, is, this is good. Dialogue is good. Um, Carolyn says, this is a quick one. So great job, <laughs> folks. Um, she wants a recipe for the kitchen pepper. Um, we do not sell it at Stratford, but I just feel like, y'all, there has not to be yet. some way. Not <laughs> yet. Say, not yet. Don't, not even, yet. don't won't even tell us everything that's in the kitchen pepper. No, right? We, can, we show up to events and he I'm gives us a I think there's some mace in there, maybe. <laughs> but, you and know, you're Secrets. Everybody saw that. Um, and then they I say, am, I am working on working on something. So hopefully, hopefully, good. you know, in a, the next couple months, we'll be able to share something with you. Fantastic. Also, the question says, were there uh, was there any cre cream in the sipping chocolate? Um, and then she wanted to talk about oyster stew, which is fantastic. Merry Christmas. Love you all from Georgia. So it was just water, right, in the sipping yeah. chocolate that you made mm -hmm. on there. So thank you for asking that. Um, let me see here. Could the people who are preparing the food in the kitchen take anything home to their families? No, it's up to it's up to Caesar's discretion. Mm -hmm. Granted, when uh, the woman of the household comes through, when she will count things like she probably has a hold on the spices and uh, she's making sure that everything in the smokehouse is present. Um, uh, if everything lines up with the numbers on the book, it's really up to Caesar's discretion as head in the kitchen to, you know, no, oh, you see, we, we burnt some, some of this or, mm -hmm. um, and you can pad numbers. Oh, he's, I mean, like he's the, he would be an expert on how much you need to make something. And if he, he's putting the one putting in the numbers, it can be padded. Granted, he cannot over calculate but I think largely largely in stories we kind of we kind of overestimate mm -hmm. how much food came out of the kitchens and made it to the big I uh, made it to the quarters yes um I mean like it's usually a small amount um possibly Caesar some of the head cooks may have um some of that food may have made it to their household but not nearly enough um, mm -hmm. they're really yeah. depending on their allotments mm -hmm. uh, and things that are being caught in the corridors and things like catfish and things that they're growing. Mm -hmm. How did I do? You did. <laughs> you, did you did good. You did good, lady. Um, so someone asked, Beth asks, and we can just touch on this really fast, um, why I referred to Caesar as a chef. Um, in my mind, this is, I sort of take, 
you know, 21st century sort of lens onto that. But for me, if someone's creating things and they're not just following the orders and following a recipe, like actually putting their, you know, their ideas and things into that. And they are an artist in that sense to me. And also in charge of the kitchen, Caesar was the top person in that kitchen. Caesar had a staff working underneath him. So mm -hmm. for me, that means he's a chef versus a cook. I would think of somebody as a cook as if they had one, like no staff, and they're literally just opening up the receipt book and following the recipe. So that's how I differentiate. I don't know how y'all want to build into that, but I think that covers it. So thank you for great. asking. I think that yeah, it helps me. in modern times to use that type of language to help people mm -hmm. understand. Because exactly when right. we say cook today, we're only thinking about At home cooks. someone who's kind of your home in cook. Their yeah, right. Your home cook. But this is really a huge job that they were doing mm -hmm. and chef mm -hmm. uh i think that's a correct term as, as as far as looking at it from a modern point of view mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I love when people ask this and thank you for bringing this up. So Stephanie says, um, what would your advice be to smaller historical sites that want to interpret the history of enslaved people that are part of a site's history, but don't have African interpreters to help bring that history to life? Um, you are looking right now at three African-American interpreters that can do beautiful Zoom uh, interpretations if need be, but there's actually a pretty large amount of African-American interpreters that are looking for work and and, you know, I think that just being in touch with the three folks here um, can really help you figure out what's in your price range, how you can make it work, because I know I can, you know, you all can speak to this too, but I know for a fact that the three of you have given so much of your time mm -hmm. to making sure these stories are told and you know, so much of this is a labor of love and these stories need to be told and sometimes they have to be told by African Americans and end of story. And so I'll let y'all take the reins. I was going to say, Elon Cookley has done a fantastic job of just gathering yeah. a network of Black mm -hmm. interpreters. It's the Black Interpreters Guild. Um, and it brought community to us because for a while we were like, are we the only ones? But there are <laughs> hundreds <laughs> of us out here. But also, you don't necessarily need a physical interpreter either to tell these stories. What you're doing on the sites, the stories that are told in the buildings and interpretive paneling, that is a start. That is a way to bring those bodies back and to tell those stories. Mm -hmm. And as people gain interest and as you're like, all right, well, we wanna do a demonstration and we want authenticity, then you start to reach out to who might be in your area or let us know. We may be able to help you out, but to really, um, to really dig deep into it, it's not, I say it's never an excuse for a site to say, well, there's nobody to do it, so we're not going to, because there are methods, there are ways, and there are means. And yeah. you got three folks here who are well connected with this community let us know how we can help. Yeah, and I believe I mentioned in, in our last talk, or maybe our first talk, Kelly, um, I mentioned Nicole, I believe I mentioned her mm -hmm. and both of them, but mm -hmm. that's what that's what Nicole does. Um, she has a website and her Facebook is Interpreting Slavery. She's contributed to um, a, a few books, um, but one in particular, Interpreting Slavery at Historic Sites and Museums. This is what she does. Um, and, and to help you to develop your programming. She's not paying me to say this at yeah. all. But, <laughs> I, should, um, I, I but should start. I travel, I try, but I do this. This is what I do for those people who, who I believe in. If, if your work is trash, I'm not gonna mention your name. Um, I'm not gonna mention your work at all because it's gonna do us a disservice. But this is what Nicole does. This is what we all do. But for someone to have their, their, their master's um, in public history and especially in this work, I believe in giving people the flowers and she has earned them. them. I'm gonna take them. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm with both of you. Um, there's no excuse not to tell the story, but I'm just gonna be honest. I'm a strong believer that mm -hmm. if you do not have Black interpreters on your site, and if a kitchen would have only had enslaved cooks cook cooking in, in that space, then you should not have white interpreters in costume right. cooking mm -hmm. in that right. space. I may get flagged right. for this, but I think that that's problematic. You mm -hmm. can put someone in a polo shirt with your logo on it and they can uh -huh. demonstrate some yep. cooking techniques. 
um, but they should not be in historical garb. Right. Yeah, one, one thing that, <laughs> that there's one thing that that the lady behind me, the late Kitty Wilson Evans, told uh-huh. me um, when I first started doing this work. Um, one of her vers- very first bits of advice to me was get those women out of that kitchen. It's yeah. not a good, it is not a good, and I feel safe to say this now, but even still, I still felt safe to say it, but it just never came up. But get those women out of that kitchen. It's not a good look because it paints, it paints a completely different exactly. um, picture. Um, and, and, and it's easy to, to kind of gloss over it or whitewash things, uh-huh. uh, so to say. But, but as Cheney said, if, if you have to do a, a cooking demonstration, um, you can do it in plain clothes. Yep. You know, and, and just have the conversation. But you have to mention the people who were really working in that space. Yep. You have right. to. Yeah. And I and also always ask yourself, um, am I doing this in historical garb? Because um, this is the only way the story can be told or because that's what I want to be doing. Exactly. And I think most of the time uh, when you when those sites approach me and I'm like, really look at this and ask yourself this question. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's the face for me. That's what you do all the people who are out there and I, I'm, I guarantee there's people on here watching white ladies like myself. I have not dressed up in colonial garb and cooked in a kitchen. Um, I feel very similarly to the my friends here on the panel, but it does really misrepresent. And I think that it's time to kind of take a moment here and just reflect a little bit on what that looks like to the public and what stories you're telling through just the presence of you being there in that space. So thank you all for addressing that. And no let problem. me see there here. Was, Kelly, there was, a one, there was a wonderful article written about 365 days ago about that very topic. We're going to um, stop that, that, the king of advertising here, but I love it. It went viral. It went viral <laughs> last year. If anyone wants to know more about, honestly, all of our thoughts on that, you can look yeah. up um, an article that I wrote that quoted all that had Cheney as a picture, and Dontavious was the cheerleader. So thank you yeah. for that. Um, Stephanie says, how long was Caesar in charge of the kitchen and who succeeded him? We don't actually know. That's something we're looking into. Our records are good in spots at Stratford and not that good in others, but yeah. thank you for asking that question. Elizabeth says, how much sugar did you add to the chocolate? I have made chocolate according to the 18th century Spanish cuisine and generally use at least equal parts of sugar to unsweetened cocoa or chocolate. But from the recipes I've read, the preferred sweetness was different in different countries. You didn't sweeten it that much, did you? I put no sugar in it at all. There was, and it was no sugar put. So good. Yeah, there was no sugar put in it at all. <laughs> you were um, using the American uh we American chocolate American. then. I had a little bit yeah, of we yeah. Oh, good. It did have a little bit. Um, the, we and we we're thankful for that because it was really good. It was spicy. It was delicious already. Yeah. And but if you, you will, yeah need to go on Amazon and buy some American Heritage chocolate because that is delicious. Any form it comes, yeah. I think you were all in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> we're just like, can we have some? Well, Nicole we have some? and I weren't licking the chocolate stone. <laughs> we're over there trying to take them. Okay. Pro tip here. Pro tip. So yes. um, oh, yeah. Uh oh, uh, Cheney. Once you do the sipping chocolate, you can mix it up, the Mars sipping chocolate. Then you want to pour it into pop molds, those oh. ice pop molds. Oh! I promise you, your summer will be great. That sounds wow. fantastic. I'm going to go buy some more American Heritage chocolate, or I'll wait till the, <laughs> the party that we have. <laughs> it's right there. I think I still a couple bags at Stratford that I have to eat my way through. Next time you see me, I'll be a little more round, so that's okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Leela says, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I'd like, to, I'd like to know what was done to keep the prepared food warm, and what that would have been a real challenge. So how do we keep the, the food warm in those kitchens? Um, so for I can talk about the catfish and the greens, because that was done literally first. Yeah. We had to keep it by the fire, not in the fire, but by the fire so that it could continually warm. And I've had it on like this lovely cast iron plate thingy, my bobber. I don't know what it was, but it was magical. But we would, you would keep the food as it's done, either in a warming kind of oven, which would be a little cove in the hearth, 
or you're going to keep them close to the fire, but not on coal so that it doesn't continue to cook. And I did the same thing with that sipping chocolate. I had made it earlier and just kept it in the in the the hearth there. And it, it it's amazing how hot a hearth gets. It cooks it was, on it all hot. three sides. Yeah, it was very hot. And it's like huge. That. <laughs> yes. and, and, and that hearth is huge. I can't John say. can stand up in that hearth. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's enough space for all three of us. And like, and then some, and maybe and then still some. a catfish. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I literally, I mean that the film was gonna have like my hand like sticking <laughs> in, like sticking the catfish. <laughs> like, okay, all right, focus, focus, focus. Yeah. <laughs> so what happens when you get four friends on a Zoom meeting or a webinar? We just start cutting it up. Okay. Focus. Oh, I love this question so much. Were some of the kitchens off from the main house? So if there was a fire, the house wouldn't burn down. Question. Yeah. That's a, common, um, that's a common that question. That is a common question. Yes. I can just knock this out real quick and we can get to the other ones. Um, so that's definitely a common question. And if you read my book uh, or other things, you'll see that. Um, so a place like Stratford, for instance, had 16 uh, fireplaces, right? And eight chimneys. So in the wintertime, there'd be fires in all of those buildings. There's no way in the world that that didn't have some sort of, you know, different risk than the kitchen. So what you see is you see these larger plantations um, move their kitchens outside right when indentured white servitude is going down and enslaved African numbers are going up. And so it was a way for these elite planters to um, sort of designate spaces according to race. So it was very influenced by the slave trade, um, the influx and influence of West African men coming into the colony, and a bunch of other stuff. So that's that's one of those things where it doesn't quite fly. So that's that's my two cents on that one. Y'all want to add anything to it or can we get to these 22 so, questions? <laughs> let's are you, let's go. Let's are, you saying that this, are you saying that this was like the beginning of social distancing? <laughs> yes. Let's hope that that has nothing to do with 2020 and you've had enough this year. I don't no, want to go no. back to the colonial era. <laughs> All not, right, thank you also, <laughs> Yeah, but also not to mention, not to fail to mention that kitchens were gross. Yeah. yeah. Kitchens yeah. were, they, right. they were gross and you don't want, if you have a very nice house, you don't want the grossness of, of a kitchen um, that mix, close, yeah. especially in the summertime. Oh, uh, the summer. You were there. The funny thing is cooking, Dontavious. You cooked there in August and you came back in December to cook night and day. Mm -hmm. I will cook in December anytime. <laughs> in the yes. Oh, I about died, but it was fun. It was great. <laughs> um, James asks, what are some of the primary sources at Stratford Hall that you have used to learn about Caesar and other enslaved people there? Thank you for all of your hard work in presenting this program. Thank you, James. So we've got a significant number of um, art... Uh, um, archival resources. We've got diaries, we have probate inventories, we have memorandum books, um, and then I read against the grain. I read against the archives, so I also use archaeological evidence. I use, um, you know, I look at a menu, for instance, and I think about what kind of labor was, was involved in making a certain you know, sort of setting of a table. And so, you know, looking at it from the traditional ways that a historian would look at it through the archival stuff, the written word, looking at oral history, slave narratives, all of those things together with the landscape analysis, we're really able, we've really been able to render these stories and bring them out. So yeah. I also welcome all of you to come and experience our um, new tours. They're very different than they were a couple of years ago. So thank you for asking that. Um, Linda says, um, as a white woman of German descent from Missouri's Little Dixie River Corridor, that sounds an interesting place, I now mm -hmm. have a greater respect for where my family's um, non-German recipes came from. My great-grandmother's cook on the farm was born into slavery and was a small girl when freed. I love history, especially food family history. Thank you all for your interpretations. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Let's see here. Oh, great question. Um, this one's like begging for Nicole, I think, because we had this idea. So originally we wanted to have Nicole um, set up in one of the existing slave quarters that we have on site to do a very different sort of filming, but we weren't sure if the 
if the chimneys were clogged or what. So everybody just went in the big kitchen. But the, the original idea was to have these sort of two stories, two worlds mm -hmm. sort of being depicted. So this question taps right into that. Yeah. Amanda asks, would the enslaved cooks at Stratford prepare, prepare food for all of the enslaved people too? So I can't speak specifically to Stratford, but general, we'll, we'll do a generalization this one time. Um, you might have people who are cooking in their own cabins with their rations. You might have the community come together and they'll say, well, you have a little bit of this left. You have a little bit of this left. You have your garden. We're going to bring things together. But I think in this situation, especially um, how we ended up interpreting it, it was we have work to do. We also have to eat. And we're going to make ours, but we're really focused again on what we need to get to the house so that once they are served, once that food is moved up and out of our space, then we're gonna be able to eat. And so I would, I would venture to say that the cooks in that space, particularly in that kitchen, they are gonna be able to make food for themselves to kind of keep themselves going. It's not gonna be the same caliber as the leaves. It's not gonna be the oyster stew that they had, but it would have been something very basic, something that they could just, that sustenance that's really holding them together. And so that's why we had that, while this is going, we're doing multiple things. Thank you for answering that, Nicole. Mm -hmm. um, Jeffrey asks, was chocolate eaten all the time or was it for special occasions? I mean, the Lees, because of the way that they ate, and you know, if I could go back in time and eat at any table, you'd think maybe, oh, definitely go to, you know, Monticello. I would want to go back and see what the Lees were eating during Caesar's time because their mm -hmm. inventories of what they had in terms of food, in terms of liquor, I mean, that's where the party was. So I have a feeling that the Lees probably ate chocolate fairly often and maybe not the, the fresh sipping chocolate that you saw Dontavius make, but mm -hmm. there's recipes for chocolate tarts, for, you know, chocolate biscuits. I mean, they were putting mm -hmm. cocoa in a lot of stuff. So I guarantee... A family like the Lees were, were munching on some chocolate pretty regularly. So thank you for asking. Yep. All right. So somebody asked here, Doreen, um, what did they mix the chocolate with? Um, fruits or nuts? Um, I mean, they, you know, the sipping chocolates changed too. The earlier chocolates from what I, I found, um, like during the 1600s, they were putting more peppers and things like mm -hmm. in there. And I actually love like some cayenne in a dark chocolate. Phenomenal. And then you sort of see the more sweeter you know, cinnamony things come in later in the period. Do y'all want to add anything to that? Mm -mm. I think you hit that no. one. I'm so ready to eat some chocolate right now. It's not even fun. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, did the Lee family dining rooms have sideboards or furniture for serving space? Yes. So Carolyn mm -hmm. asks, there's actually a whole alcove um, that's for the butlers mm -hmm. um, and someone like... Our, one of our favorite people to talk about is Sonny. Um, and I can do, do you want to go ahead and tell that little story real quick? Or should I introduce Sonny? Or how do you want to do that? We don't have listen, to, but. Listen, I just love, and, and I'm just going real quick. I just love the story of Sonny. Um, Sonny was one of those servers there at Stratford Hall. And story goes that he and one of the overseers kind of had it out. But I mean, duked it out in the yard, and and his his way of resistance was to come after the fight and just stand up disheveled in in the in the dining room in the middle of a dinner, um, all dirty and and just like what I'm here, do, I'm here to do my job. What are you gonna do? Um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but he was uh, he was punished. Um, and, and eventually ran away from the site. So, mm -hmm. um, but that, that was like the last straw for him. So it just, it just goes to continue to show that level of humanity. Even though they were enslaved, they still had feelings. They still weren't going to put up with everybody's mess, you know. Mm -hmm. so and you think just, about, just, yeah. That level of boldness to be able to do that. That's why he's one of my favorites, you know. Yeah, I think his, his story is so important, too, because, you know, there's a lot of common conversations that you hear in the community of, like, you know, oh, house slaves this, house slaves that. And when you start to learn more about those who were enslaved in the, that those domestic spaces, they weren't, you know, Uncle Tom's. They were in there subversive. They were in there exactly. having to be, you know, watched by that family 24-7, having to work on their feet as y'all just did with those hard mm -hmm. shoes by that fire having to be victims of rape right so like mm -hmm. all of these things that 
are packed into being in that space, um, were part of the sort of, you know, fabric of being someone who was one of those, quote, house slaves. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about it like that, you think about Sonny, who, you know, for his tenure there, he was there during Philip Ludwell Lee's tenure, who was, I mean, a diva. Philip, Philip Ludwell Lee is one of the most dramatic <laughs> Lee men. I mean, I, if I could meet, meet one Lee men, it would be that guy. I know he had a big wig. I mean, who knows? I just had this idea <laughs> of who he was. But this guy insisted on having a full set of French horns on the top of his carriage when he rolled through town. So you can imagine what he wanted his dining room to look like. So, you know, you had to be tip top, everything had to be perfect. And you have Sonny who is resisting, right? He's resisting his status as an enslaved man. He is pushing back the only way he knows how. And that is by walking in that treasured space and standing there and mortifying Philip Ludwell Lee in front of his guests. And that's what upset <laughs> Philip Ludwell Lee so much. So again, I think Bonnie's, uh, you know, story really highlights the sort of daily, you know, dealings of a lot of these folks who are in that house, right? And having to deal with those kinds of relationships. So, all right, sorry, I get preachy. I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, were, were there other... Story. It is. It's such an amazing story. And there's more. That's why you all have to come to Stratford. All right. right. Susan says, um, were there other receipts at this time using chocolate at the Stratford other than drinking chocolate? So everybody was sipping on chocolate because it was the easiest thing to do. But Cheney, I think you found a recipe, right, for chocolate yeah. biscuits. Yeah. There's a chocolate yeah. tart recipe. Yeah, there's yeah, a lot of... Yeah, so what we're going to do, um, I actually have a nice little stockpile of them. So I will type them up and I will set, have them sent out um, when this Zoom link goes. So you will all uh, have some wonderful chocolate recipes that are not just sipping chocolate. And also we're going to have another chocolate program on February 13th, and that's going to be 100% chocolate programming. So just come back for that one as well. So thank you for asking. Bobby says... We did some research of our own and figured out that the Irish, who are Roman Catholic, adopted oyster stew at Christmas Eve tradition um, because they abstain from eating meat on Christmas Eve. Yes, I'm Catholic and Irish. I totally get that. And don't consider oysters to be meat. Hilarious. But I understand <laughs> Friday and all that. Like, you know, we're weird. I did it. <laughs> There's always been a large Irish population in the Boston area, which explains why I've been exposed to this tradition growing up in Maine. Absolutely. It would also explain the version of oyster stew. Um, um, yeah, I know has a healthy dash of Worcestershire sauce in it. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Bobby, for that. I am so ready to eat some oyster stew right now. It's not even yeah. funny. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay. Uh, Michelle asks this. Um, good question, Michelle. Can you share mm -hmm. more about the impending, impending trade after Christmas that worried the enslaved population at Stratford? So, I wish I could say this was only at Stratford. This was something that plagued um, anywhere that had enslaved people. Basically, you know, enslaved folks were property, and it was just that mm -hmm. simple. And so when the owners, the master enslavers, when they had debts, which most people uh, during that period had debt, they would um, try to figure that out by the end of the year. Oftentimes that did not come in the forms of, oh, here, I'm going to write you a check and I owe you some money and we're all good. They would actually give um, enslaved people to other people for the debt because that was part of their worth. Um, they would also, mm -hmm. quote, rent them out to other people. Mm -hmm. And so you did not always know who was going to get taken away on New Year's Day. So you you can imagine the years going by, you don't know if your child's going to get taken away, you don't know if your mother's going to get taken away, your husband, your brother, whomever, entire families were commonly yes. split up. And so that kind of impending doom was something that you saw often. And it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't even just New Year's Day, it was a constant fear um, throughout these communities. Do y'all want to add to that? I was going to yeah. say, people think about the fiscal years and business terms today. Just think about it then. If, if the books don't balance, something's got to give. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. during this time, that something wasn't, oh, let's sell a horse. Oh, you know, maybe we don't need yeah. these 15 buggies. It's let's get rid of Paul. Let's get rid of um, Mary. And let's get rid of, oh, you know what? They have some kids. Let's get rid of them, too, because we need to recoup. And, and that was the reality of it. It was a, a balance of books. So when people say, oh, well, the enslaved at this plantation, they worked so hard and they got so much. For some folks, it was our lives depend on this. Our lives depend on our labor. 
our family structure depends on our labor. And we are going to do everything that we can humanly do to keep that together. Because they knew December 31st, they knew the next day, who is that man at the house? And you would have those that worked in the house that could hear, that could understand what's happening. They would be messengers to those in the fields. And that's why you see at Christmas time, a lot of the enslaved population running away uh -huh. because they probably got word, so-and-so is coming for you. Bet, I'm out. Yep. And, and it's, and it's, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was gonna no, say, was gonna say it's, <laughs> it's just such a, it's just an easier time to run away as well mm -hmm. because yeah. of the parties and the things that are yep. going on. I'm sorry. No, I was gonna, that was what I was saying. It's the distraction of it. You mm -hmm. can get missing. Um, you can, oftentimes they might've had passes to go visit loved ones. And a lot of people say, one of, when we look at terminology with um, the enslaved community, people say, well, those that ran away, they're not runaways, they're freedom seekers. Sometimes they weren't seeking freedom. They were going to be reunited with family members that were on other plantations. And they were just like, I'm not, I'm not going back there. And so it's really important to understand the why or the connections, the, fam the familiar connections that people have to neighboring plantations. Yeah. And those passes were, those passes were used as a, as a means of control as well. So it's called the Christmas, Christmas in the quarters is called the big time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a seven to 10 day period where you can, you know, depending on the plantation where you can rest and you can relax. That's mainly for your field hands and for those yep. people who are not working in the house or in the kitchens. And so they do have that time to be able to relax or to visit um, other plantations and things of that sort. But if if they are not given a pass, then, then they have to take that chance mm -hmm. to be able to leave and go away. But again, these are times that were filled, um, that could have been filled with festivities. There were uh, games that were played on certain plantations called Christmas gift with the children where they would run with their little socks, you know, to get candy or fruit or whatever from the master. Christmas and gift, it was Christmas a more, gift. Exactly. And it was a more festive time. However, this festive time was to kind of ease, I'm thinking to kind of ease mm -hmm. into what we call heartbreak day, which is January 1. Um, we, we today are, you know, celebrating Christmas uh, this Christmas season uh, in, in the eyes and, and under the, the shadows of this pan this awful pandemic yeah. um, in, in, in the world. And we're trying to make the best of what we have. We don't know today what tomorrow will be. So we've come so far, but baby, we, we still got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we again, as Nicole said, share these things in common. Um, with the enslaved community. The only thing that we have is the freedom of choice and the yep. freedom to do what we want to do, the autonomy to do what we want to do. Absolutely. We're also, when uh, looking at running away, um, some people who ran away were not fugitive slaves. So by the 19th century, that means crossing over state lines. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people approaching heart heartbreak day, yep. they're taking their children and they're running out into the woods. They anticipate coming back eventually. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, running away is just a terrifying. Um, I know we were out there at Stratford Hall on, it just looks so dark. Oh my God. It was so dark. And you know how, when you're in a dark space and you just let your eyes get it, you know, you, you wait a few minutes and your eyes can get used to it and collect as much light as possible. I'm sorry, baby. It I didn't was happen. For 10 minutes. And it was still, I could not see my hand. I put my hand out in front of me mm -hmm. and I still couldn't see it. And so yeah. running out into the darkness, that's mm -hmm. just, it takes quite a bit of courage, fear, or foolery, because I, I'm the majority of people um, during this period who ran away and made it were young men. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say teenagers. That testosterone <laughs> got them going. <laughs> right? I mean, like their brains aren't fully formed. 
and they don't they probably they may understand like how dangerous it is and the mm -hmm. consequences of running away uh, but you know they're like I can still make it because you got to have that little to get you through that darkness yep that's just, that's, mm -hmm. okay. I see our homie Joe McGill. Yes, so there's a lot of there's been a lot of praise. Um, so if y'all, I, I know Nicole's reading the Q and A, but um, just so you all know, Dontavius and Shaney, there's been a lot of really beautiful praise for the program, and you know, this is such an honor to do this work, and it is an honor to work with all of you. I mean, I really, this is I think the beginning of a very long. <laughs> A dedicated relationship between the four of us. Um, yes. So yeah, mm -hmm. I know. I That's almost feel good. like I'm. I was just. I'm sorry. I was going to do a, give a shout out. I saw a good friend of mine, Jordan Fleming. So mm -hmm. hey, Jordan and, and Brian. Mm -hmm. Joe, Joe Miguel, who, yeah, and Joe Miguel, who I think brought all of us together in one way yeah. or another. I mean, I know, you know, I met Joe years ago, and then he introduced me to Dontavius, and then I met Nicole and Chaney. Mm -hmm. So, hello, Joe McGill. Um, he has a slave dwelling project, and he is a wonderful resource if mm -hmm. you want to get uh, also to the person, too, who asked about African American interpretation. Yes. Raise some money and get Joe McGill to come to your site. It's yes. a game. Changer. So, yeah. please do that. He is phenomenal, and he brings such wonderful attention um, mm -hmm. to your, your site, and he will bring, he will change it forever, I guarantee. So, hello, yes. Joe. Thank you for zooming in. Yes. And let's see here. Thank you. Thank you. A beautiful video. I understand that you are oriented in interpretation of slavery in the South, where you were often I'm sorry, where there was often a large enslaved population living and working together, but how do you suggest an 18th century mm. historic site in the North interpret the kitchen when there's evidence of one enslaved man on the property who was listed as a farm laborer and no evidence of an enslaved cook? Um, that is a great question. Do you want to hit that, Chaney? I, you work in the I North. I can, <laughs> yes. Um, so it, it uh, of course, in the North, it's uh, quite different because we do see um, a, a smaller ratio, uh, meaning that there is usually, um, there were less enslaved persons on one site. That does not mean that there were less enslaved persons. So if you, I live in New York, and um, if you go to the Hudson Valley, there were sites where there were hundreds of enslaved persons on one site. They don't, call them plantations, but that's a plantation, baby. That's a plantation. <laughs> We're mincing words here. <laughs> so, um, but in uh, places like city centers, but even out into more rural areas, you see a lesser uh, ratio, meaning that the people that they have enslaved are doing labor outside, not labor uh, on uh, inside. Um, mm -hmm. We also have depending on what years we're looking at, we have a lot more men. Um, we start to see more women uh, later in the 18th century, but up north we see a lot more men. So um, we're also in places like New York City, um, they are really um, working to load and unload ships. Um, these are the types of labors we're seeing, making roads, building buildings, um, this is the same all over. Um, but when you're looking at kitchens, um, you want to find out who are those people in the spaces. Um, and a lot of spaces that I've seen, we see um, a lot of, um, I'm sorry, I'm pulling a blank, uh, a lot of immigrants coming from European countries working in those spaces. Mm -hmm. um, that's the vast majority that I've seen where I am. I also do a lot of work in Connecticut. Um, in the three places that I've done interpretation, um, that one of them, it was Black women, but the two other ones were um, Irish uh, cooks, and uh, one of them was an English cook as well. So uh, you just got to find out that interpretation. When, when we say that um, we're very specific in saying that we do not believe that uh, white interpreters should be interpreting in costume and spaces that would have been 
cooked uh, that would have had black enslaved cooks primarily. Mm -hmm. um, that does not mean kitchens that had um, white indentured servants um, or even hired white cooks. Um, so just like knowing your knowing the history of of the kitchen and the people who are working there. I know that's so, it can be very difficult. Like we know that Caesar was there, but like if you say, what year exactly did he stop working there? Mm -hmm. um, so those things, I hope that was helpful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Makes yeah. sense. But there's so no, I... no reason to sidestep or cre recreate history to say, oh, the person in this space was an indentured cook and make up you know, make up mm -hmm. <laughs> false truths, <laughs> or in other words, lies. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> just right, to right. be able to Follow be comfortable, you know, or just to right. be comfortable with um, with interpreting that space. Yeah. Um, and it so, and it happens, and it happens because people are just uncomfortable with the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or or making it a lighter situation, like, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, but we had it's okay. There were white people cooking in this kitchen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there were still enslaved yeah. persons on the site. Yeah. 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 All right, Hillary asks if you do first person interpretations in addition to third person. I do. <laughs> I do. Cheney Cheney has done has done some work, but I can speak to myself. I do first person interpretation. Um, I'm a storyteller. I've written a particular story based off of um, slave, the narratives of the enslaved. Um, but I just gave Cheney an idea. I shared an idea with Cheney. Um, that that I'm going to try out for 2021 um, with the Chronicles of Adam. So just stay tuned. It's it's going to be dope. <laughs> Nicole, I'm going to tell you about it. I don't think I told you. Holding back secrets. I see. I see how I it. think uh, <laughs> to plug Dontavius as well, his Chronicles of Adam oh, program my is goodness. phenomenal. And I, I can't speak highly enough about mm -hmm. it. So if anybody wants to have... Okay. Dontavi has come and do that program um, and not do, you know, historical cooking interpretation, you will not be disappointed. Not that I wouldn't want to eat your food, but your, right. your Adam program is just stunning. If you want your soul snatched mm -hmm. and just taken from those highs to those lows, I have, every time I watch Dontavius, I cackle because I, I, I literally could sit there with tissue and just hand them out because people yes. are so moved. But it is the way that he truly captures. See, it's my time to brag. Um, but it's the way that he truly captures the emotions, the variety of feelings, and just the experience in Adam. You get, you understand it. You get a whole picture, and you walk away like, "Wow, why didn't I learn that in school?" Mm -hmm. You will be transfixed uh, and transformed. Just and yes, and transformed. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, he is our hype man uh Dontavious but we just need to take a moment here and say mm -hmm. um he will change your life it is literally a <laughs> your calling. life yeah yeah okay can y'all hush y'all know I cry easy oh we're sorry, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. but thank you that, um Ruby asked where you can he can see Adam so what's the best contact for you Dontavious uh Facebook uh, is is where I, I house a lot of things, YouTube and Instagram, um, and you can find it under the Chronicles of Adam. Um, but I would be remiss if I did not thank y'all for your kind words. But I would be remiss if I did not mention or give honor where honor is due. The queen of first person interpretation is the late Kitty Wilson Evans. Mm. I got the juice from her. This I, I it's too far for me to reach, but it, it's a it's a I try to get it. I turn my camera off and share it later. But it's a photo of her behind me. Um, this lady would, yeah, she, she you just can't put it into words. And we lost her um, the beginning of 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 November. Um, she transitioned. She went with the ancestors, mm -hmm. and where she's now happy. Um, but she left in each one of us um, a bit of who she is. So she continues to live through our interpretation. Yep. But thank y'all. I love y'all. Your check is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Alex here. 
There's so many questions that just came in. I'm trying to yeah. figure that out. Oh, this is a great one. I'm gonna let you guys chew on this for a second. Actually, before we get into that one, a real serious question. Um, and we could probably recommend some books too. Melinda says, please talk a bit more about slavery in the North. I didn't realize that existed. Um, how long did it last? Mm. Um, yeah, so I would highly recommend um, any book by Ira Berlin. And I think that Many Thousands Gone is a really good way to start. It is um, a very, very well-researched, beautifully written um, sort of step into the world of enslaved people. And it will give you that kind of northern and southern context that I think you're going to need to understand exactly how broad and how deep the institution of slavery was in the DNA of our country. Mm. I'm going to let y'all hit the rest. I so, say um, yeah, I, I specialize in slavery in the north now. Um, although I think it's very important um, that you, if you talk about slavery in the North, you have to have an understanding of well-rounded because mm -hmm. it's all interconnected. So uh, actually New York City actually had the second largest slave owning population at the time of the American Revolution and only second to Charleston. Uh, so there were a lot of enslaved persons yeah. in the North. Mm -hmm. um, it was a different type of slavery, but it was right. not kinder or gentler. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, we have the same amounts of, uh, of isolation, but it's mm -hmm. a different type of isolation. And yeah. then I said earlier that the ratios are a lot lower. So uh, the average enslaved person in the North is probably the only enslaved person in a household, which is very isolating. Um, whereas in the South, um, you, the, there's a larger African population, whether free or enslaved, meaning that you have people who look like you, mm -hmm. um, where you can find some type of community and solace, whereas uh, some places like in Connecticut and Rhode Island and Maine and Massachusetts, you can be the only black person for like 20 miles. Um, mm -hmm. Think about just how isolating that is. Also, um, people coming off, being purchased right off of the auction block, coming off of a ship. Mm -hmm. And think about how foreign it is. And then being pushed into a house with these, with these people who speak a completely different language and you've got to figure out how to cook. You got to figure out what they're talking about. And there's no one else there that's like, hey, welcome to this nightmare. Um, let me tell you what's going on and orient, orient you here. Um, a lot of the times they're trying to figure that out in, um, in different ways. Um, I find that also in New York City, um, you see more of them working on large projects like roads and buildings, um, loading and unloading ships. Mm -hmm. I will recommend that you go to the African burial ground in lower Manhattan Learn yeah. from the ancestors. Yeah. Visit them. That just broke my heart. Yeah, because yeah. you to be can look at their bones. Yeah. 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 And you see they were carrying heavy loads, yeah. the bones of the children, of those babies. Mm -hmm. And you can see their little, the curves in their backs and the flat spots on their skulls where their skulls weren't even allowed to form, harden, yeah. form when they were put, packs were put on their head so that they could carry it up into those ships or mm -hmm. unload them from these ships and take them to warehouses. Mm. Just come Thank over you, and Shane. visit me in New York. Yeah. Woo! I'm a, right? <laughs> so I have a, that's, so I that, have, that's for I have those a... who say, that's for those who say slavery didn't happen in the North. Oh, I know. <laughs> but there's so much of what we what we deal with in the 21st century that is the sort of rewriting of history after the Civil War. You mm -hmm. know, the North was, to, you know, saintly and the South was evil and this whole sort of like strange yeah. myth yeah. that sort of we're all dealing with and trying to sort of 
push back against. So, um, yes. Oh, okay. So here's that. God. Sorry. <coughs> just real quick. Slavery ended in New York in 1827, uh, 4th of July, 1827. So we in New York celebrate Freedom Day on 4th of July. Wow. Yep. And even, I mean, that, that yeah, photo of Kitty, though. If, um, I mean, it's just, can we see it? My ring light is kind of in it. You just want to break but our hearts tonight. Yeah. That's Kitty. It's really beautiful. <sighs> so, funny question to end the evening, y'all. Mm -hmm. Ready? Yes. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Do you ever do first person interpretation and refuse to break the role when you get annoying people who ask challenging questions? Oh, refuse <laughs> to break the role. Listen, I think I've shared this story. Um, I, oh. Yeah, so there's a couple times. There was one that I was doing a, a program and it was first person completely. And the guy, I walk into the room as a server and the guy who is actually part of the, the interpretive crew announces to everyone in the room, oh, the Negro has brought the tea. I have to, I was mortified and angry all at the same time because I knew what he really wanted to say was something else has brought mm -hmm. the tea. Um, he was trying to, you know, get his historic rocks off or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he it was a room full of African-American visitors. And I had a choice to make. Do I break yeah. character yep. or do I continue in character but get him together all at the same time? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I chose that. I chose that. <laughs> and I was able to do it based on my research with, with, with the narratives. Mm -hmm. And... I addressed him and that family's history. I addressed him and responded because I was portraying a gentleman named Nate. He was a blacksmith, but he was also the son of Mr. Carwell. He was mulatto. Um, and his mother was the head uh, cook or whatever you want to call it at the, at the house. I said, I responded, I said, my name is Nate. I said, and clearly you're not from here because you don't you don't know how to address me, that you don't uh -uh. address me. I'm not to be seen or heard. So if you don't mind, excuse me. I set the tea on the sideboard and I left the room with a trail of people following me. There was a lot that was supposed to happen, but everybody <laughs> like, followed me out of the room. They're like, we're going to follow Nate. Me. Yeah, they, they met me in the basement and they were like, what just happened? And I had to break character then because that could have easily destroyed their interpretation mm -hmm. at that particular historic site. Yeah. So I was able to explain to them that he made a poor choice in his interpretation. However, this is the real deal. Mm -hmm. mm. And I find people, um, I find a lot of white interpreters, first person, have not done uh, the full research of how the interaction between mm -hmm. Black people and white folks mm -hmm. during this time. And it's a very complex situation. Um, it really all depends on who enslaves this person. Remember that enslaved persons are an extinction, uh, an extension of the household of the yes. enslaver. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think that people see a lot of, you know, gone with the wind mm -hmm. and they just don't, they haven't done real research. They don't right. understand that really someone who talks to an enslaved person in a fine household would have been seen as uncouth, ignorant, yep. and someone who needs to come to the back door. Mm -hmm. And so that's, and that's that also, how I look at him. <laughs> yes, exactly. And um, this idea that, um, yes, an enslaved person is a, has a lower status in society, mm -hmm. but as an extension of their enslaver, they could get somebody right together. Mm -hmm. Especially mm -hmm. if they're from a <laughs> fine household as the lead. And mm -hmm. it's so interesting when people do that to kind of rattle you. I always kind of just want to, I don't do first person because 
<laughs> not my ministry. But <laughs> we have to remember that the enslaved weren't even seen as human beings. So right. why are you even fixing your lips to speak to me? If you knew the history, you would understand how wrong you were in that moment. Right. Right. But then it's always a chance to make it a learning opportunity mm -hmm. to yeah. then teach that person. I, I, I don't get an, I don't get visibly annoyed with, mm -hmm. with people who do some things and you're just like, now you know better because you know what? They may be doing it intentionally to egg you on, but then there's somebody else in that group that's like, Oh, I don't, I don't understand. And they truly don't know. And it is always an opportunity to school them like Don did. It's like, I'm gonna leave, but we're going to talk about this later and getting your audiences to really understand why that's important. This is not just something we do for make believe and have fun. This is, we need you to understand that we honor them as men and women and human beings, but in their time, they were equivalent to a chair. They were equivalent mm -hmm. to a horse they weren't seen as human beings. And so when you address them as such, just like Cheney said, oh, you ain't got no manners. You ain't got no home training. So we gonna school right there. Exactly. I love it. I love it. Definitely. Thank y'all for um, doing that. And I, I don't wanna, we could probably have this conversation until six in the morning, but um, I'm just gonna go ahead and sort of start gearing this up. Um, and so, yeah, Angela just wrote, I hope someday this is part of every child's education so they can understand the true history of this country. Yes. Um, perfect last comment, right? To sort of wrap this thing up. I think all of us do this work. Um, we testify on behalf of the ancestors. We testify on behalf of those who were enslaved and could not speak for themselves. I think it's important for all of you. Yes, go read the scholarly work, but go also go to the Library of Congress website, loc.gov. Look at the slave narratives. They are free and accessible. And I don't even mean the big fancy ones, the Douglases and etc. Go read the WPA narratives. You can yes. read 50 in an hour. Read first person talking, you know, not the ones that got out, became famous, the people who survived, persevered enslavement, whose parents, grandparents, great, great grandparents were enslaved, who were then interviewed in the 1930s. Read those um, depictions of slavery because they will open your eyes and you will find stories of New York City, you will find stories of Missouri, you will find stories of, of Texas. You will hear about that New Year's Day. You will hear about the religion, the resistance, the poisoning, the, the ways in which they persevered that institution. Yeah. And when you read those first person narratives, there's nothing more powerful and more informative than understanding from the very people who live the experience. Yeah. And I also beg all of you, as you celebrate the holidays and you think about chocolate and you have Christmas dinner, think about the history of this country. Mm -hmm. Think about this history of the country, not in some weird fairy tale way, but as I said at the beginning of this talk, a sober history is a real history that will teach us and let us grow together as a nation. Until we acknowledge that there was enslavement, until we acknowledge the pain, the systematic racism that was born out of not only enslavement for hundreds of years, but Jim Crow for a hundred afterwards. Great. We cannot, understand, we cannot understand 2021, which we're about to go into, without understanding 1619, 1501, and the African kings and queens that were brought into this country and these nations against their own will. So understanding those experiences, understanding those people, listening to people like Nicole Moore, like Cheney McNate and Dontavious Williams and all the other storytellers and people that testify on behalf of these enslaved people, listening to them testify on, on behalf of those enslaved, on those ancestors, bringing you to sites, visit plantation sites. Do not be afraid to go to those sites and not only go there, ask questions. Make it so those interpreters that don't know what they're doing, sit back and say, you know what? I don't know the answer to that. Write letters, ask them to hire people who know what they're doing to interpret these spaces. Plantations are not just a place of sorrow. They're a place of pride. African-Americans, enslaved African, uh, enslaved folks built places like Stratford Hall. They built this country. Every single building that you think of that was built before 1865 has the hands and the sweat and tears of enslaved laborers on it. So when you think about those who built this country, who built the culture, who contributed to not just what we think of as America, who brought wealth to families like the Lee, 
release. We cannot think of our national wealth, our cultural wealth, without giving a serious bow to those 12.5 million who were brought over here against their will and all of their descendants and those who died in the Atlantic on the way over here. And I'm getting a little preachy. Now I feel like I'm in my the class. The doors of the this church is. are now open. Is, is there, there one? one? <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say that these are important things. See, I miss teaching. I miss my classrooms. But I think you have to also take a moment, take a moment and thank Marge Wrigley because they have been brave in what they are doing. Yes. And having this conversation around chocolate, the sweetest, most loved thing in the entire world with the most bitter, shameful nugget of American history is something that we all need to bow down and thank them for. So thank you, Marge Wrigley. Thank you, Nicole Moore. Thank you, Cheney McKnight. Thank you, Dontavious Williams. And thank to all the almost 600 people who signed up, who will be listening to us go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And most of all, I want to dedicate tonight's lecture, tonight's program to Caesar and to all those who were enslaved at Stratford and throughout the African diaspora. Yes. Also, come visit us at Stratford Hall. There will be more programs. We are trying to raise money right now to have these programs um, continue. This has been, I think, the most successful programming campaign at Stratford Hall. And I want to say I'm very proud of my people, y'all that have come together and made this series this year, something that I am incredibly proud of. I don't think, I don't think, I know that I could not done a, have done this without you. And I think everything from that first program, Dontavious, that first program in August up until now has been a game changer for Stratford Hall. And I appreciate you all. I want to invite all of you as well to Zoom in on February 13th for our next Mars Wrigley program. It's going to be Dr. Lenny Sorensen's going to be talking about chocolate. That program is going to be all about chocolate recipes. Um, there'll be no oysters or catfish for us to eat. But I want to invite you all. And any last words, um, my dear friends? Listen, the hearts and minds are clear. <laughs> listen, is there one? <laughs> <laughs> I just... Thanks for the opportunity. Again, thank you, Mars Wrigley, for even for stepping foot in this arena. It speaks volumes to understanding our history and the legacy of your product in our history and the men and women that are involved in that product. Thank you, Kelly, for having us. I saw a lot of folks, a lot of colleagues, a lot of new folks. Thank you for being engaged in this history. I was reading all of the comments, all of the questions. Research, reach out. Um, don't let this be the first or the last time that you hear these stories. Dig deeper and each one to each one. Kelly, I just want to tell you thank you um, for this opportunity yet again. Um, thank you, Mars Wrigley. This is, this is a brave step um, mm -hmm. and in the right direction to be able to, to help educate our country. Yes. Um, and not just our country, but the world. Mm -hmm. um, we, we now have touched the world with this. And, and, and we couldn't do it without the support of, of Mars Wrigley. Um, but I also want to, like I said, tell Kelly, thank you and the staff uh, there at Stratford Hall. Yes. But before I go, I've got to give a big shout out to my friend, my homie, my girl, Amy Connolly. Yes. Amy is a <laughs> Amy. work horse. Amy. Amy gets the work done and she does it behind the scenes nobody the scenes. ever really get she does it without fanfare mm. but she is the absolute best and i absolutely love 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 working with her so yes. yeah that's i just wanted to make sure that i said that because she has to clean that chocolate stone <laughs> oh. <laughs> And it's true for all these programs, Amy's there doing all the dishes afterwards, scrubbing yeah. and everything else. So thank you, Amy. Yes. And uh, I want to thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, it was a true pleasure to spend time in that kitchen with Nicole and Dontavious, but it was also a true pleasure to have that research time where we mm -hmm. were having those moments of um, experimental archaeology, yes. uh, which I mm -hmm. absolutely love. And it was just, it was so magical. Um, Amy, oh, just thank you. Yeah. <laughs> also, shout out to Justin for making us look oh, fantastic. Yes, yeah, <laughs> I, I wanted to also, 
Yeah, I also wanted to also <laughs> give a direct thank you to Justin and Chris because they, they worked their magic on that video. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, thank you for making us look good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think too, and you know, another, yeah, just go ahead, sorry. Uh-oh. 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 All right. Well, yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, And I I beg you all, um, those of you that are not familiar with Stratford or haven't been in the last couple of years, please come out and take the tour. It's different. Um, Come out and see the exhibit that's going to open up. It's different. And um, yeah, please be in touch. And thank you all and have a wonderful, wonderful Christmas and holiday or whatever you celebrate. And please think of this programming and think about everything we talked about tonight as you sit down to Christmas dinner. Thanks, everybody. Happy big time. Bye. Bye. Bye.